Hello, my name is Michael Corselli. I'm the founder and chairman of Flya. I want to welcome everyone to today's webcast, which will be hosted by EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. EMQQ is currently the number one performing ETF in its category over the one-year, three-year, and five-year timeframes. And we have its founder and CIO joining us today, Kevin Carter. Kevin is a seasoned investment professional and entrepreneur in both the indexing and active worlds with over 20 years of experience focusing on China and emerging markets. He's been a featured speaker for Columbia Business School, Bloomberg, Guggenheim Partners, Morningstar, and numerous CFA societies. Kevin was previously the founder and CEO of AlphaShares, an investment firm offering China-focused ETFs in partnership with Invesco. He's also the founder and CEO of Active Index Advisors that was acquired by Natixis in 2005 and the founder of e-investing acquired by E-Trade in 2000. Kevin received a degree in economics from the University of Arizona and began his career in 1992 with Roberts, Robertson Stevens and Company. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Kevin, uh, for putting on this presentation today. And with that, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you uh, all who have uh, joined today. So I'm going to uh, talk about a few things uh, here today. I'm first going to give you just a quick uh, overview of my, my background to give you uh, some perspective on how I think about investing. I will then uh, summarize uh, everything I've learned about emerging markets in the 15 years that I've made that my focus. Uh, I'll summarize into two bullet points that I think all investors should uh, uh, know and think about. And then I will uh, try to convince you that our approach uh, to emerging markets is in fact a superior approach uh, for long-term investors. So in way of background, I'm talking to you today uh, from 15 miles east of San Francisco in a town called Lafayette. Uh, I've lived and worked here my uh, entire uh, life since graduating from college 28 years ago. And uh, as Michael said, I started at a company called Robertson Stevens and Company, uh, which then uh, was the premier West Coast investment bank. We used to say it was the Goldman Sachs of San Francisco, although younger people think that that might mean the devil, so we don't call it that anymore. But it was the leading technology investment bank. And I had one interview there, which lasted 20 minutes. And the first 19 minutes of the interview was a discussion of college basketball. I then got a one minute uh, overview of the investment business and I was then told I could start work on Monday to which I immediately said, how can I possibly start Monday? I don't know anything. The guy interviewing me took out a piece of paper and he said, go buy this book. And he wrote down a random walk down Wall Street. Now, uh, I went uh, on my way home. I picked up that book and read it over the weekend and showed up Monday morning. Uh, those of you that are familiar with this book know it's one of the sort of foundational pieces in the uh, indexing and efficient markets world. Uh, the author, Bert Malkiel, a longtime uh, Vanguard board member. So that's how I started. But as I tell people, uh, first and foremost, I am a, an Omaha person. Uh, I try to think about all business and investing decisions through uh, my uh, perception of what that lens is. And uh, uh, having said that, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, I've been business partners with this guy, um, who uh, is, again, uh, one of the founding fathers of indexing and, and actually the chairman of the committee that launched the first ETF. And so I have had uh, one foot in the active world and one foot in the indexing world. As part of that, Burton and I actually started a company uh, called Active Index Advisors, uh, which was acquired by Natixis at the end of 2004. But a few months before that, Google had gone public. And as part of their uh, planning for the IPO, they asked Burton 
along with Bill Sharp to come down to Mountain View and give a discussion about investing for their employees. And I was not involved with that discussion, but I, I knew it had happened and I had dinner with Burton uh, the night before. And uh, a few months later, my phone rang and it was a guy at Google who had uh, presumably Googled me and he asked how he could invest with us. I tried to uh, direct him towards an advisor. Uh, we were a separately, man a separate, man an SMA manager and available at uh, some of the wirehouses. And uh, he said he'd rather just invest directly with me. I became his advisor and a number of the other uh, earliest Google engineers. And a few months after I met these guys, uh, Burton uh, had been going back and forth to China and ended up writing a paper about investing in China. The Google people found out about this. And 15 years ago this spring, we drove down one morning, Burton gave his talk about investing in China, and all of these people looked at me and said, we want to invest in China. And uh, I had never been to China before, and the only thing I really knew about it uh, from an investing standpoint was what was in Burton's paper. And I really had no idea what it meant to invest in China and how in the world one might go about doing that. So that's how I got pulled in, and quite literally from the day that talk occurred until today, my entire focus uh, professionally has been on figuring out what does that even mean and how ought investors uh, go about investing in China and uh, more broadly emerging markets. So with that background, let me tell you what I've learned. So uh, first of all, uh, emerging markets are the world. There are 85% of the world's people living uh, in emerging and frontier markets. They're even more of the future as measured by young people uh, they account for almost 90% of the world's population under the age of 30. As this slide shows on the left, they're now bigger than developed markets. They've been growing at about uh, twice the rate of the developed uh, uh, market GDPs. But if you look at the right side of the slide, you'll see three red arrows showing you emerging markets share of a few different categories. The top red arrow pointing out again the vast majority of the world's people in the developing world. But the two lower red arrows are showing you that in the areas of consumption, emerging markets are way behind. And it's the delta between the top red arrow and the bottom two arrows, that is lesson number one, and that's the most important thing to understand. The thing that is emerging are the people, billions of people moving on up and they want stuff. They want more and better food, more and better clothing, they want appliances, they want entertainment and vacations, they want cars, and they want their kids to go to college. And that's the story. I didn't have to figure this out. It was very well documented by the time I got uh, on the scene. And uh, even McKinsey and company uh, has concluded that this is the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. And even if McKinsey is wrong, and it's the second or third biggest opportunity in the history of capitalism, it's definitely the thing that investors in emerging markets should be focused on. It's what I've been focused on. It's what EMQQ is all about. And we will come back to that part of the story. Now, the second thing uh, that people need to understand about emerging markets, and this applies uh, uh, very much to those that use uh, ETFs or an index-based approach, is that there's a real problem with the indexes that track emerging markets uh, if you're trying to make money. Now, I learned about this problem in the first five minutes I was involved. So after that talk uh, in April of 2015, uh, we drove back to San Francisco and I uh, walked directly over to the portfolio managers and I said to them, the Google guys want to invest in China. Give me a list of all of the companies in the China ETF from iShares, FXI, which then and today I believe as the largest uh, China ETF. Now, before they handed me the list, Burton pulled me aside and he said, look, when you get the list of all the companies in the China ETF, you're gonna see that the vast majority of them are government owned banks and oil companies, state owned enterprises, SOEs. And I said skeptically to him, yeah, I've heard about this. And he said, let me give you an example of how these companies operate. And the example was this. He said, you've got a Chinese manufacturing plant with 15,000 employees. 
It's incredibly inefficient. It's been losing money for a decade and it's basically out of money. The management of that uh, manufacturing plant goes across town to the Chinese state-owned bank and says, we need more money. Now, a normal banker would say, no, you can't have any more money because you didn't pay us back the last money. But the state-owned banker says, well, if you lay off 15,000 people, they'll all be out in the streets protesting. We can't have that. And so it makes another low. Now, when I heard that example, I got literally nauseous inside because in my simple Omaha brain, earnings equals value and the growth of earnings equals the growth of value. And if you're telling me that the people that manage these companies don't care about that, why would we invest in them at all? And in the case of the China ETF back then, it was over 80% state-owned enterprises and the consumption part of the story was quite small, less than 10%. Now, in broader emerging markets ETFs, state-owned enterprises are still about a third of the index. And the poster child for what's wrong with these companies is the Brazilian state-owned oil giant Petrobras. Now, uh, many of you uh, have probably at least seen the headlines over the last decade about what's transpired in Brazil, but Essentially, you had an enormous scheme where the elite of Brazil were systematically stealing billions of dollars from the, uh, from the Brazilian state-owned oil company, Petrobras, and thus stealing money from you or your clients if you're investors in traditional uh, broad emerging market ETFs. And included in the uh, list of culprits, uh, a lot of their corporate executives, a large percentage of their congressmen, and the last two presidents of the country, both of whom are now in jail for basically stealing your money if you're investing in emerging markets the old fashioned way. Now, the problem is actually even larger if you count two other groups of companies that have a lot of the same problems. In Russia, you have the oligarchs that took over the state owned enterprises of the Soviet Union. And in Korea, you have the Chabel. And again, if you included those, uh, with the SOEs, it's about half of the index. And those companies have a lot of, a lot of the same problems uh, like people going to jail. On this slide, you can see protesters wearing a couple of masks. The mask of the man, that's the chairman of Samsung who went to jail for financial crimes that included bribing the woman pictured to the right, the former president of the country uh, who was convicted of taking those bribes and also sent to jail. So. This is a real problem, and this is why investors ought to avoid uh, traditional uh, ETFs and index approaches and ought to do what I saw happening in the foundations and endowment world in my first uh, eight or 10 years focused on the space. So uh, at the beginning of my China life, as uh, mentioned in, the, in my bio, we launched a number of China ETFs with Guggenheim Partners, which have now been acquired by Invesco. But when I wasn't supporting the Guggenheim people, I spent most of my time in and around New York City with a few dozen family offices, foundations, and endowments. And I watched this evolution occur uh, as these investors slowly increased their allocations and then got a little more targeted. Now, I didn't call it Emerging Markets 3.0, but I stumbled on this blog that I've referenced at the bottom and the author had put good words to what I was living, but it's pretty simple. These investors start with a toe in the water, uh, a small allocation. They get a little more comfortable and increase that allocation, call that Emerging Markets 2.0. But then after watching people go to jail in handcuffs and not making a lot of money in their exposure, they get a little bit more targeted in how they approach emerging markets. And in the case of uh, the Bloomberg family office or Harvard, that might mean uh, hiring a specialist on the ground uh, manager in China and, and also one in Brazil. Or for people that I uh, spoke to that listened to me, I said, look, this is really easy. Just buy the consumer. There's uh, That's the story. Leave out the legacy economy. Leave out the materials and the oil and the corruption and just buy the emerging market consumer ETF, uh, ECON, E-C-O-N. Now, I had nothing to do with that ETF, 
but I knew it existed. It owned the 30 largest emerging market consumer stocks. And if you wanted to just get precisely down to that story, this uh, uh, story that McKinsey calls the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism, just by econ. Now, it was about six and a half years ago that I woke up one morning and I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done with my career? I was a young, cocky, value investor, Charlie Munger wannabe stock picker person. Somehow I got mixed up with this guy at Princeton and now I go to work in the morning to uh, work on Chinese index funds of all things. And I uh, said to myself, I need to get out of this. And so I told the people at Guggenheim, I would continue to support them but that I was going to set up my own fund and do my stock picking the way I like to do it. And I did that. And once I had my partnership organized and funded with my own money, uh, I invested it in five stocks. And then I thought to myself, well, I should at least drive around town and see if anybody I know wants to invest in this partnership with me. I made some appointments and the morning of those appointments, I made some slides to bring with me to show these people what I was doing. And one of the slides listed the five stocks that I own. The first three stocks were stocks that were in the emerging market consumer ETF. Uh, those three stocks trading in Hong Kong, Want Want, the Nabisco of China. The second and third companies, Chinese sportswear companies, Li Ning and Peak Sports. You can think of them as the Reebok and Converse of China. So those were the first three stocks, all in the consumer uh, index and the emerging market consumer ETF. But then I had two other companies that I bought. And while they were clearly part of the emerging market consumer story, they were not included in that ETF because they were called technology companies. The first one trading on the New York Stock Exchange, Wu Ba, W U B A. This is the Craigslist of China, went private uh, earlier this month. And then the fifth and final company. Trading on the NASDAQ, Mercado Libre, M-E-L-I. Mercado Libre is best thought of as both the Amazon and the PayPal of Brazil and every other country in Central and South America. So those were the five stocks. I looked at them afterwards and I thought, you know what? All of these are part of the consumer story. The three that are in the emerging market consumer ETF are great. They're growing at 15 or 20%. I think they have a moat in form of brand equity, to use a Buffett term. And importantly, the CEO is the founder of the company and owns the same share class as I do. And presumably, he cares about it going up in value. But then I looked at the other two companies that were not in the emerging market consumer ETF, and they were literally growing their revenue at 100%, seven times as fast as the traditional consumer names, and were incredibly profitable. Wu Ba had a 94% gross margin, which is where I look for moats, and that's still the highest uh, margin I've ever seen. Um, and uh, so I just remember thinking, these two are the best of these five. They're, they're growing seven times as fast, and while their PEs are higher, the, their peg ratios were lower. And I had that thought and uh, printed up my slides and I went and had my meetings. Now, after my meetings, I was driving home with some checks in hand and at a stoplight, my telephone rang. It was a friend of mine. And my friend asked me, what's the best emerging markets ETF for my daughter's college fund? Her daughter was three. I started to tell her what I told everybody that asked me that question, which was to buy econ. But then I had a light bulb moment and I said to myself, wait a minute, the best emerging markets ETF for the long term does not exist. And that afternoon, I went straight back to the office and I began to organize EMQQ. It launched 100 days later on the New York Stock Exchange in the second week of November 2014. So now let me tell you how to think about EMQQ. This wasn't quite as clear to me as, as it is now, but essentially EMQQ is a mashup of three mega trends, a great confluence of very large uh, things that are sweeping uh, the planet. And the first one is this, we've covered it. Uh, the rise of the emerging market consumer uh, is the first mega trend. Now, back then I was noticing something about the way my family was consuming. It was right about the time I had a smartphone. I had only had it for a couple of years at that point. 
but it was clearly changing the way my family was consuming. Back then, my family had been going to Target four or five times a week, which was easy to do. It's three miles from our house. Uh, the roads are paved. We have a car. There's free parking. But all of a sudden, the trips to Target started to go down, and this guy was starting to show up at my house once a week and then twice a week. Now, before the coronavirus got here, my family had basically stopped going to this store except for maybe once a month. Meanwhile, this guy and others like him were at my house so often that I could tell what color the truck was without even seeing it. So if you think about how this device has changed our consumption, but remember, we've had computers for a long time. I've had a computer in my life for 30 years. This particular form of computer was definitely changing our consumption pattern. Now, if you map that over to the developing world, the story gets really big. So the second mega trend is not called the smartphone, it's called the computer in form of a smartphone. So what's happening is all of these consumers are getting their first ever computer. It's not on their desk and it never will be. It's a 50, 60, $80 Android based smartphone. And it's made in China by Xiaomi, by Vivo, by Oppo, by Huawei. So that's the second mega trend, the computer reaching the world for the first time. Every year they're getting more affordable and uh, higher quality. And they come with the third mega trend, which is something we also take for granted called the internet. Now I've had internet access here in the Bay Area for 25 years, uh, first on telephone lines. Uh, then uh, over cable. Now the internet just shows up in my pocket wherever I am. Well, the reality is that most of the world was never wired the way we were. And so these people are getting their first ever connectivity to the internet via mobile broadband, uh, via Wi-Fi, and it's still pretty early. If you look at this chart, you'll see smartphone penetration. Uh, the green bars are the emerging economies. And if you look towards the right, you'll see India is only about 25% penetrated. And that means that there are uh, a billion people that still don't have a computer or internet access, but that's changing very rapidly. Just in the time we're on the phone here today, tens of thousands of people around emerging markets will get their first ever computer, their first ever internet access, and it will change their lives and they will become consumers as so-called digital natives. And here is the result of this great confluence massive fundamental growth. This is showing you the last decade of revenue for the index, the companies in the, uh, in the space. There's 83 publicly traded companies today in the index. And you can see that over the last decade, they grew their revenue at an average uh, annual rate uh, compounded of 38% for a decade. Now that is hard to do. Now I'm not 100% sure of anything in the world. Uh, particularly as regards investing. However, uh, I've given this presentation to uh, dozens of CFA societies around the world, probably well over 100 different investment groups like yours, <clears throat> and I've offered rewards to anybody that could show me a sector that's ever grown this fast. Uh, I've asked everybody I know that's smarter and more experienced than me, and so far I have not gotten one uh, person to say, this is not the fastest growing sector and show me something that's grown faster. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 99.5% sure that this is not only the fastest growing sector in the world today, but it's also the fastest growing sector of, public, of uh, publicly traded uh, companies ever in terms of revenue growth. So this is a big deal. And with that fundamental growth comes value creation. So you can see here uh, in uh, blue uh, how investors in the emerging markets internet space have done over the last decade. And uh, in yellow, at the bottom, hugging the, the line across, you'll see what the broader indexes have done. It's been a lost decade for emerging market investors who use traditional approaches. And, and in fact, if we took this line back another couple of years, you'd find that you'd be still underwater and have less than you put in to start with. So uh, fundamental growth, uh, significant value creation. Now, let me make one public service announcement. I've told you 
earlier what I think the big flaw is in traditional indexes. Um, but I, I think that, that emerging markets uh, are, in fact, the largest value trap in the world. Time and time again, I see uh, an investment professional say, look how cheap emerging markets are. Their PE is 10 or 11. The S&P's PE is twice that. Emerging markets economies are growing twice as fast. And so I, I, I can get twice the growth rate for half the multiple. How can that not be a bargain? It's a trick. Uh, if you knew what the Agricultural Bank of Ch China was uh, or paid close attention to Petrobras, you probably wouldn't think a 10 or 11 PE multiple is a bargain. So I'm not optimistic that this uh, yellow line is uh, all of a sudden going to go uh, gangbusters in the next decade. So uh, in terms of uh, some of the companies we're talking about that are part of uh, the EMQQ index, Alibaba is the flagship uh, for us. It's actually my backdrop is a, uh, a photo of the Alibaba headquarters in Hangzhou. So everybody knows Alibaba. It was the largest IPO in US history and the largest in the world when it happened. And let me make an important point about uh, these companies. Most of these companies, in fact, have chosen to list here in the United States historically. Uh, they're being, and the reason is this, they're, they're, while they're founded by local entrepreneurs like Jack Ma, they've been getting funded by US institutional investors. That could be Harvard or Stanford's endowment through a fund, or in these two cases, corporate investors. You had uh, Jerry Yang lead a billion dollar investment into Alibaba, which grew into a $50 billion value and was essentially all Yahoo had left of any value at the end. And in my very favorite story from 2019, uh, this Brazilian fintech company Stone went public and amongst its major investors on the IPO, none other than my heroes in Omaha who bought 5% of the company. So my point here is this, corporate governance is your biggest problem in emerging markets. These companies have fantastic corporate governance on both an absolute basis and on a relative basis uh, to things like Petrobras, I think you'd have to say they have outstanding corporate governance. So uh, in a part of the world where people are stealing your money and that's your biggest problem, uh, you avoid, I think, a lot of that uh, in these names. So now the other company, that's most, uh, the, the two largest, next to Alibaba is Tencent. I'll assume that uh, most of you have at least heard of Tencent when we launched uh, uh, six years ago, only about 20% of the people we spoke to knew what Tencent was. And so to make it easy, we'd say it's the Facebook of China. And that's true. Uh, they, uh, Tencent's uh, app, WeChat, is the social network. It's how I talk to my friends and colleagues uh, in China. So that's a fair comparison. However, and this is a very important point to this whole story, you can't call Facebook the Tencent of the United States. And the reason is this, in the case of Alibaba and Tencent specifically, but also in the case of many of our other holdings, they don't have a US equivalent. And it's because the consumption infrastructure in emerging markets is greatly undeveloped or underdeveloped by definition. And by consumption infrastructure, I'm talking about the following types of things bank accounts with a debit card in everybody's pocket, televisions on the wall with a thousand channels, and Target stores. Because those types of things don't exist in the developing world, it's allowed Alibaba and Tencent with a billion users each, and also some of our other companies, to go into every consumer vertical and digitize it and compete in ways that their US counterparts cannot or have not. Those consumer verticals include everything. They include healthcare. Alibaba has a healthcare business that's now publicly traded separate from Alibaba, was added to the EMQQ index in June. Uh, Tencent is preparing to IPO its healthcare platform, We Doctor. Um, it's entertainment. Uh, Tencent's uh, music and entertainment business, separate publicly traded company in the United States now, TME. Uh, Alibaba won an Academy Award a couple years back for its movie uh, Green Book. Uh, it's groceries, 
Uh, Alibaba's uh, Hema market is by far the most amazing thing I've ever seen in China. It is quite literally a, a combination of uh, Whole Foods and the Jetsons. But by far the biggest of these subtrends, uh, the biggest of these verticals that are getting digitized, uh, the biggest one is FinTech. Uh, this is a photo I took in the city of Nanjing uh, early last year. And uh, in any Chinese city, you'll see people come in from the countryside uh, with uh, uh, their fruits and vegetables or eggs to sell. And they'll set up in the alleys and uh, sidewalks. If you look in the foreground of this photo on the table to the left of the bananas, you'll see two QR codes, one wrapped in green, one wrapped in blue. Quite literally any place in China you want to spend money to buy something, you'll find those two QR codes. And I can't uh, overstate how big of a deal this is. You can buy a pigeon, uh, you can pay a beggar uh, using a QR code. And this is a big deal because once you have the money, there's a lot you can do with it. And Alibaba and Tencent have the money. And, um, uh, and getting the money on the phone is sort of the gateway, if you will, to all financial services. And that includes insurance, that includes uh, credit products and loans, it includes uh, investments, uh, funds, et cetera. And this story is by far the biggest subtrend in EMQQ. And it's about to have a big coming out party in the form of Ant Group's IPO. Now, Ant Group is the, the financial uh, sub of uh, Alibaba. It was actually separated from Alibaba when it went public, uh, when Alibaba went public here. Uh, that was for uh, some state uh, owner, uh, bank ownership restrictions in China. Alibaba retains a third ownership in Ant Group. And it is preparing to IPO, and I am uh, quite confident it's going to be the largest IPO ever. Uh, right now, they're talking about a $35 billion raise, which would put it $6 billion ahead of Saudi Aramco, uh, who raised $29 billion and currently the largest IPO ever. So this company is a monster. It's uh, experiencing incredible growth. Uh, it has 700 plus million people that use it virtually every day, all day for different uh, things. It really is a, a one-stop shop for all things uh, uh, money related. And uh, it's going to uh, uh, be a big offering and the company is, is, is booming. They, uh, in the first six months of the year, they had 40% revenue growth uh, and did 10 billion of revenue. It's very profitable. It has a 30% net margin. So it netted $3 billion in that six month period. And to put the size of the operation into, in scale, uh, they did in the first half of the year, $17 trillion of transactions were processed, which is six times the size of the British economy annually. So Ant Group will put a big flag in this FinTech story. And it's sort of a paradox that, uh, you know, if, if you'd gone back in time, you would have thought I would be the person uh, that was uh, operating like George Jetson. I'm a fintech entrepreneur, uh, not far from the Silicon Valley, and I should be the guy that walks around with my phone uh, holding it up to pay for everything. And the paradox is that's not me. Uh, places like Kenya uh, are way more advanced in terms of uh, uh, mobile payments. Kenya's GDP is about 80% mobile phone based. So uh, in many ways, the emerging market consumer is ahead of us digitally as they leapfrog what we think of as traditional consumption. Mercado Libre, I mentioned one of the companies that uh, inspired EMQQ. Again, this is the uh, leader in e-commerce and payments in South America. It's been our best performer uh, over the last two years in terms of contributing to our returns. And that's largely been on the base of its fintech business accelerating. And I think uh, the uh, uh, stocks in the news a little bit uh, today as well. So you think about South America. Do you want to own Petrobras, which is in your broad index twice, or do you want to own uh, internet companies like this uh, dynamic uh, company, Mercado Libre? And by the way, this company is not even included in the broad uh, emerging market uh, ETFs from the likes of uh, Vanguard and iShares. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Yandex, this is the Google of Russia. It's also the Uber of Russia. It's ride-hailing Happy Index Taxi beat Uber. Uber uh, quit Russia, but not before taking a minority stake in 
uh, Yandex Taxi. Um, now, India is an exciting place right now. Um, we wish there were more publicly traded Indian internet companies. This is one example, make my trip. But there's some big stuff going on right now in India, and we're uh, optimistic that 2021 will be the year that the big uh, unicorns of India start to come public. Uh, Flipkart, which is the largest e-commerce company in India, we had thought would IPO a few years ago, but uh, Walmart bought the entire company or control of the company, and uh, it looks like they may in fact uh, uh, list uh, that part of uh, their operation now, Flipkart with a K, uh, that may add IPO next year. And then perhaps the most exciting thing that we see going on is what is uh, happening with Reliance Industries, the old line uh, conglomerate that historically has been a petrochemical and textiles company, has launched an incredible digital push and raised uh, $20 billion in the last several months from uh, investors, including Facebook, Google, Intel, Qualcomm, and a whole bunch of the world's premier uh, private equity investors. So uh, you heard it here first, uh, Reliance Geo, J-I-O, is a company you will all hear about in the coming years, hopefully uh, including an IPO next year. And finally, uh, Africa. Uh, this is Jumia, Nigerian e-commerce leader that, that went public on the New York Stock Exchange uh, last year, uh, headquartered in Nigeria, operating in uh, seven or eight other uh, countries as well. So um, now those are some of the public companies. Let me also just point out that in addition to those uh, 83 public companies, investors in the space get indirect exposure to literally hundreds of private emerging market internet companies, not because we go out and invest in them, but because Alibaba, Tencent, and a lot of the other large internet companies in the developing world invest in other emerging market internet companies. This is one example. This is the Uber of uh, China, Didi, that includes both Alibaba and Tencent as early investors, and also uh, includes Apple. Here's Tim Cook with the president of Didi, Gene Liu, and uh, this company's in the news this morning is apparently they are preparing uh, an IPO for next year, um, uh, likely in Hong Kong. And finally, uh, my favorite of the uh, private companies you get exposure to. This is Indian uh, payments leader, Paytm. This company is 45% owned by Alibaba. So by owning Alibaba, you're already getting this exposure. And I feature it because my favorite story from 2018, my heroes in Omaha also uh, venture investors in this company. So um, in summary, what I have uh, uh, told you is a story of growth. I believe uh, unprecedented growth explained by this uh, great confluence of three mega trends, 85% uh, of the world's people becoming consumers and getting their first ever computer and internet access at the same time, a lack of traditional consumption infrastructure and leapfrogging explaining uh, the perhaps unprecedented growth rate, side benefit in a part of the world where corporate governance is your biggest enemy, you actually get very good corporate governance in these companies. And you also get a lot of exposure to uh, private companies and frontier markets. So now let's talk uh, buy, sell, or hold. I've been very worried about how uh, this virus plays out uh, with the, pop, uh, the populations in emerging markets, and in particular, the very dense uh, slums of uh, places like uh, Mumbai, pictured here, where social distancing is not possible, where uh, sanitation is is uh, quite uh, uh, poor in healthcare, and so I continue to be concerned about that. Um, now, China has uh, had many advantages in this and has it contained. Uh, it will continue to flare up as it is currently in the eastern port city of Qingdao, but they've been able to limit the outbreaks to a few hundred cases here to four, and that's largely uh, because of a uh, smartphone-based uh, contact tracing. So. Uh, they, uh, more than anybody, have this under control. They did not have to throw trillions of dollars at the problem. Um, and by all accounts, the economy is back. We had very strong numbers out yesterday. And uh, they are driving uh, whatever growth is happening in the world uh, this year. They'll uh, account for a full 30% of global growth. And um, people are back in the streets and back in the restaurants. And they're back in Starbucks and Apple 
and uh, buying Teslas. So that's good because that's uh, the biggest part of the EMQQ story. And finally, and uncomfortably for me to talk about, the reality is that uh, this coronavirus has done nothing uh, but boost the importance of uh, uh, internet and e-commerce business models. It's um, driven an acceleration of things that were already uh, uh, widely adopted, and it's forced uh, the adoption of certain uh, e-commerce platforms uh, like distance learning and telemedicine. So with all of those things combined, uh, EMQQ has looked uh, very well positioned. Uh, in terms of the trade war uh, and the delisting threat, I'm going to skip the details of this and just to go to the bottom line of this slide, which is you know, 13 years ago, after I had a few years of China under my belt, I remember very vividly thinking, Americans are going to warm up to this story. I had spent time there. I had studied the history. I had made friends there. And I thought, you know what? This is a great place. This is an incredible culture. They've had the largest economy in the world for 48 of the last 50 centuries. Uh, they had a terrible 100-year period. Uh, largely uh, initiated by Western powers colonizing them, and uh, they ended up with a form of government that uh, we don't like, and but we did help put in place uh, by supporting Mao. And uh, I thought that America would warm up to China, and I was dead wrong. Uh, the if we had to make a chart of the quality of relations between us and China, it's making uh, new lows, and will continue to pose. Uh, real risks, and I think uh, lots of headline risks that will be overreacted uh, to. So uh, in terms of our approach, very simple. We buy uh, every uh, publicly traded emerging or frontier market internet company that meets our criteria, and uh, we rebalance it twice a year. And uh, it's cap weighted with an 8% cap on the largest position uh, to make sure we uh, are properly diversified. And uh, there are two uh, different uh, products that uh, track the index, one here in the U.S. and one available offshore as a usage. And um, finally, in terms of valuation, I know we've had a, a strong run. And I know that when um, our uh, performance uh, chart for the index was most recently updated, I had a visceral reaction to the, the slope of the curve, as I think many people would, but I don't use lines to make uh, investment decisions. I use numbers, and quite specifically, I use the PE and the growth rate. I use the PEG ratio as the only number I care about, and right now we have a PE in the low 30s uh, for the group, and uh, this year's growth is going to be about 20%, which is less than it would have been otherwise uh, without the pandemic, but in a world today where uh, entire industries are shriveling and uh, having massive revenue declines. I think a 20% 20, uh, 20 growth rate is looking phenomenal. And the estimates for next year is a reacceleration and, and a 25% revenue growth. So I look at the PE and those numbers and I see a peg ratio of 1.25, 1.3, which I think is quite reasonable. And if you compare that with uh, any of the other groups, the US uh, technology companies that have a, a, a higher a PE and a half the growth rate, uh, or the S&P 500, which uh, has a PE that's nearly as high and is going to have almost a 10% decline in revenue, uh, in spite of uh, the strength in the sector, uh, I think investors with a three or five year uh, time frame uh, will do just fine. So that uh, completes my um, prepared comments, uh, Michael, and I think Kyle is not going to be joining us. So if you could uh, uh, moderate the, the Q&A, that would be great. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, so here's the first question. How mature is the EMQQ growth story now? And do you see it performing similarly over the next five years? I, I do. I think... Um, uh, I, uh, you know, the growth rate's going to slow. It has been, if you, you know, if we went back to those slides, you'd see that the, this, the, the growth rate at the beginning of the decade was in the 40s and then it uh, declined into the 30s. And, and that will be the case um, uh, as the law of large number, uh, numbers dictates. But, um, but no, I, I, again, with the peg ratio of one and a quarter and uh, still uh, growth in the mid 20s, uh, I think uh, investors will do uh, 
uh, fine. I feel the same way I did when we launched the fund. And, you know, I'm not a, a prideful person, but, you know, someone asked me what the best emerging markets uh, approach was for the long term. And I uh, thought about it and I thought it didn't exist. And I think uh, if you uh, see how this space is done in the last five years, it's performed better than any other version of uh, EM and, and not by a little, by a, a meaningful amount. In fact, the, uh, the second best uh, uh, approach is one that uh, Wisdom Tree offers, which just uh, leaves out the state-owned enterprises. But that's the second best uh, way to go over the last five years, but, but it's pretty far behind uh, in second place. Okay, great. Um, second question that we have today. Do you anticipate EMQQ getting more exposure to India or other geographies be besides China in the coming rebalance? Well, I think the answer is no. Um, you know, we've had uh, growth and IPOs in the uh, uh, places like Brazil and Africa, but, but we're also continuing to have IPOs uh, from China. And uh, again, the ant group is, is so large that um, we've, we might actually see an increase in the China allocation, but it's been pretty steady. I mean, we don't manage that or have a target for that. It just is what it is. We buy everything that meets the criteria. And, uh, but, you know, the reality is China's, it is the emerging market. It's the biggest by every measure. It's also the biggest internet economy in the world. So uh, I don't uh, think it's going to decline. We need Flipkart and Geo to come public uh, in India to give us some meaningful Indian exposure. And we're optimistic that'll happen in uh, 2021. Absolutely. Um, all right. So this next question is from uh, a family office out of the UK. Um, Andrew wants to know, how does the EMQQ index construction differ from the EMQQ ETF construction? Uh, con yeah, construction. Are you actively overweighting and underweighting specific index components? If so, why? No, we are not doing that. The the um, the products uh, that track uh, the index should uh, should do just that. They should replicate uh, what is in the index. Now, there's you know obviously times where. Uh, there's inflows and it, you know they might be off a basis point or two on, on certain weights, but there is no uh, traditional active management done or uh, intentional uh, overweighting of certain uh, sector, certain names or uh, countries. So it is uh, very much a, a rules-based uh, index. And the, the index itself is calculated by an independent uh, third party uh, in Frankfurt uh, called Soul Active. So they, they take the index methodology which you can find on the website, and they simply apply it to their data and uh, produce the index, uh, and, and it's reconstituted again, as I said, uh, in June and December. So, uh, Kevin, there's a couple of people asking if the slides will be available after today's presentation, um, which also is one of our, our questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Michael will, of course, uh, provide them to you. But uh, anybody that is uh, interested can, uh, I guess, inform us. And if you have their information, we can send them. Or uh, you can see our contact information here on uh, this slide uh, if you want to just reach out to us directly. OK, great. Um, next gentleman is asking, how should I think about adding EMQQ to uh, an emerging market allocation? OK, well. First of all, I'm obviously very biased about this, but I'm, I'm becoming increasingly militant in the way I think about this. And so I, I think I can, I, recognizing that I'm, I am biased, I'll answer this in uh, as uh, intellectually honest a way as I'm able to do that. Um, when, when we launched, I would tell people to use it as a satellite within their emerging markets allocation. So I'd say use a broad traditional market, uh, uh, Vanguard or iShares as your core, and then offset it using EMQQ as a satellite. And I didn't really 
feel that that was true, but I knew it sounded better for people, more palatable, perhaps uh, cosmetically uh, something they're more comfortable with. But, but you know, then I started to say, you can do that and use a core satellite, but you'll have less money in five years than if you just bought this. And um, so now to the extent somebody has to do a, that way for whatever reason, the wisdom tree uh, offering, as I said, that's, I think that's the way to go. Leave out the legacy of the state owned stuff, which they don't do a perfect job of, but they, uh, they leave enough of it out that it's performed significantly better than owning everything and including the SOEs. But in my, I really do believe, look, if you're in emerging markets, implicit in the word emerging is some sort of growth. And this is the tip of the spear. And uh, it happens to have, uh, you know, in competing with the broad indexes and a lot of their problems, uh, it, it's sort of free of those things. And so uh, I think, uh, I don't, I, I, I've again, gotten to a point where I, not only do I think that this ought to be the EM allocation uh, for people, but for people like my colleagues who have an average age of 30, uh, I'm starting to question why they, you know, need to own U.S. mid-cap stocks or international bonds at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm becoming radicalized uh, uh, quite quickly uh, at the at the time. So, but I'm also very biased. This is my my product, and I and uh, uh, but I do believe in it. So here's here's a timely question: um, Will 5G rollout be slow to EM, or will it accelerate the adoptive nature of these markets? Uh, they'll they uh, in the case of China in particular, it won't even be a, a they'll they they'll be by far ahead of us. And um, uh, in the case of other uh, countries, I I, I don't I, I can't speak to you know, there's 27 plus sort of countries we're talking about here. And uh, I can't say I've surveyed everyone and where they, uh, you know, have sort of timelined out to when they'll have 5G, but, uh, you know, and, and then also in, in the case of India, um, you know, they're barely getting 4G at this point. And so um, I don't, uh, 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 I don't know that I can speak to the places other than China but I, you know, I do think they have an advantage, which is, you know, a lot of these places are, are, are um, uh, underdeveloped in terms of uh, mobile uh, service. And so perhaps they'll have the opportunity to, to leapfrog there as well and uh, start with 5G. But China will definitely be at the forefront of this fast. So, Kevin, there's, there's a lot of questions. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all of them. Are you, you going to be able to stay a, a little bit longer uh, and continue answering questions? Or Absolutely. I'm here for okay. you and your people. So uh, any questions we can cover awesome. uh, on the screen, let's do it. All right. So next question. What are your thoughts on the new Shanghai technology-focused star exchange and A through H premium? Uh-huh. Well... Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, so uh, uh, let me let me just explain what what those are for people that don't know. So the Star Exchange is basically part of the the Shanghai Stock Exchange. It's a it's a technology focused board where uh, they're starting to list new uh, uh, tech uh, growth businesses, and it's also where. Um, the uh, half of the uh, Ant Group IPO is going to trade. And that market has been uh, sort of in a frenzy this year. Uh, the mainland Chinese stock market, the A share market, has, is dominated by retail investors. I mean, if you, we've seen the statistics on what's happened with Robinhood and things like Robinhood here in the US and how the retail share of uh, trading on our exchanges has. Uh, basically double, but it's still less than 20%. Well, <clears throat> it's about 80% in China. So this is a this is Robin Hood on steroids, uh, that local market. And, and it's been very prone to booms and busts over the last decade. And uh, right now it's in a bit of a boom. Now, the other question is about the AH premium. And now this is, this is something that's very much on my mind. And I've been talking about I haven't heard much uh, from other people talking about it. But 
here's the here's what this is referring to. The, the Chinese A share market, the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges, have historically been largely closed to foreign investors. And also, while they've opened up, they still don't allow short selling. And so there's about 100 companies that trade both in Shanghai and in Hong Kong. Uh, traditionally and historically, that's been the state-owned banks and oil companies. And because there's no arbitrage ability in the mainland, and because most of the money there is historically uh, trapped, if you will, in uh, the mainland, it's led to a situation where th the same company has traded at a different price on the Shanghai exchange than the Hong Kong exchange. And uh, that's usually been a premium. Uh, and this is an index you can pull up on uh, the Financial Times and probably other places, but the China AH premium is still a thing. And uh, back in my early China days, uh, that premium was 100%. So the entire universe sold for, for twice the price in Shanghai as it did in Hong Kong. Currently, that, that premium is about 40 uh, or 50%. And with regards to the Ant Group IPO, as I've been saying, I don't know if I can say I'm worried about this, but uh, my my uh, somewhat uh, whimsical way of saying it was, I, I think that the Ant Group is going to break the Chinese stock market because uh, they're talking about a big offering, again, 17 and a half billion in Shanghai and a similar amount in Hong Kong. And as I mentioned, that star market has had a frenzy and uh, but those companies that have traded there historically are they're not ant. There is not, there's nothing like ant. Uh, 700 million people in China use ant every day, uh, multiple times. And so uh, I am concerned that the frenzy uh, in the mainland market may push that price uh, to a significant premium to the uh, value in Hong Kong, which poses a lot of interesting questions for. Uh, people like us um, as to, for example, how, how do we think about the market cap if the prices are different in two different uh, exchanges? So uh, we will uh, participate via the Hong Kong uh, listing for, uh, for, sure, for sure when we uh, do add uh, Ant. But I, I, I don't know what will happen specifically. And I, I can't think of a you know, specific problem that could occur, but I'm not sure there's not something that might occur, but I, the, that premium is a big deal. And, and uh, I just, I haven't heard anyone talking about it as we lead up to this uh, IPO. Sure. So, so I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today. It's two o'clock for those of you that have to leave, uh, please feel free to disconnect and thank you for your participation. For those of you that want to stay on, we're going to continue to, uh, you know, ask questions. We have a lot of questions. I'm going to go right into one right now. Um, global head of TMT Upstream at IFC. And he is asking, Kevin, this is the second time I attended uh, your workshop after the Washington CFA event and find your presentation fascinating. I find that your investment philosophy has captured the migration of value in the last 20 years in the internet space. Do you think that the current trade war may limit the future growth of Chinese companies and their ability to project growth internationally? Well, first of all, thank you for the super uh, kind words. Um, I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, I think it's going to impede lots of things. It's going to, I mean, you know, in terms of globalization and capitalism, I think both of those things are being uh, impeded by uh, actions largely led by us. And um, so I, I just, uh, I'm troubled by the, the whole thing. Obviously, uh, we are uh, currently lobbying other countries to uh, join our uh, tech, technological blockade. Uh, if you will. So I think that the, the broader answer is that yes, and that everyone's going to you know, be a, a loser in this. Um, in terms of this particular story, um, you know, the rea reality is that, that the Chinese uh, internet companies and, uh, uh, and others in the emerging markets, they haven't really competed here in any meaningful way. I mean, you can use Alipay at Walgreens, I suppose, but 
it's not a, a meaningful part of their businesses. And, um, and, and I also think that, that it's the hardware part of the story where, you know, the, the real uh, damage is going to be done and where, you know, the, the global infrastructure from handsets to the, to the uh, 5G towers, I think most, I think, I think that will be negatively affected. But the, but the reality is that if uh, Huawei can't uh, make you a, a, a $50 or $60 Android uh, phone, there's a lot of other people uh, that will and can. And um, so, uh, so I think yes is my general answer, but I, I don't think it'll be a meaningful uh, negative impact on, on the story that I've uh, walked through. And thank you again for the nice comments. All right. So this next question is coming from a registered investment advisor out of Chicago. It looks like EMQQ is up 55% year to date. Congratulations. And 76% in one year. Put simply, should we be concerned about adding to EMQQ at this time after the significant run-up? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the world's a, a scary place, and uh, I don't make short-term stock market predictions. Um, I uh, know that uh, we were down 30% in 2018, and I suspect that we'll be down 20 or 30% again at some point. Um, but uh, I don't uh, make uh, you know predictions about those things uh, in the short term. And again, uh, I look at, uh, at at numbers. And when I look at the numbers here, uh, I don't feel like this is uh, some sort of a bubble. Uh, I feel uh, essentially the way I felt uh, uh, six years ago when we organized this. Uh, I think the PE is uh, in the low. 30s and the growth rate uh, top line continues to be, uh, tw you know, 20% in, in, even with this horrible year we're having. And again, I think 25% next year. So uh, everything's relative. And I think relative to uh, the U.S. tech companies, which have a, a, a as measured by the FANG, uh, a higher PE and, and uh, almost uh, a growth rate that's uh, almost only half as much. I I'm not uh, concerned. And again, versus the S&P 500, uh, which in January had a PE of 20 and, and growth expectations for the year of 5%, so a peg of four uh, before this. So I'm, uh, I'm not worried. I mean, I, again, I don't, you know, who knows? I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a civil war in our country and we're about to uh, vote on who's winning that. And uh, uh, who knows what will happen uh, between now and the end of the year, but I'm, I'm not worried about uh, valuations for long-term investors. So the next question comes from the president of a private equity fund. Um, he's curious to know if uh, EMQQ has exposure to fiber in any capacity. And if so, what's your take on fiber's adoption and growth potential uh, abroad in EM markets and uh, in comparison to the U.S.? Uh, I'm sorry, is the question fiber or fiver? Uh, it says fiber with a B. Okay. Well, I, I guess I don't, um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. I mean, obviously all of this, uh, the the backbone uh, uh, of this ecosystem is uh, there's wires involved in fiber, and um, uh, so yes, we're involved. We now we don't invest in uh, carriers or uh, people that uh, we don't invest in people that make smartphones. We don't invest in people that make uh, any sort of hardware or the components of the. Uh, uh, tech infrastructure. We simply invest in uh, companies or uh, internet uh, operating businesses. Okay, gotcha. I hope that answered the question. I, I'm not sure I did. But. Um, so if he didn't answer your question, please feel free to uh, ask uh, to, to add in the chat box, um, you know, any, any qualifying information. Um, so next question is from a family office up in the Northeast. Um, 
She's asking, we got in China, Asia is what about Hong Kong Connect? Okay, so um, uh, yes, the, the, the first uh, time I, and only time I bought a Chinese A share was uh, through Hong Kong, the Hong Kong uh, Shanghai Connect program. Now, the, 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 the Chinese uh, access to the A share market has evolved. And when I first showed up, there was a list of 30 companies that had gotten, a, or 30 investors that had a Q fee quota, which was a qualified foreign institutional investor, which uh, you received uh, via an application process. And those were investors like Yale and, and Harvard and, and some of the major families uh, and institutional investors. Uh, then about uh, six and a half, seven years ago, the Hong Kong Shanghai Connect program, which had been talked about for years. Uh, it was sort of like the little boy that cried wolf, but uh, they finally turned it on. I remember talking to some of my colleagues and I couldn't believe it. And I went straight on to Interactor Brokers and brought my uh, purchased uh, some Kwai Xiao Mu Tai uh, for myself, 600519. And uh, so that is a pipe that is uh, open, but it's, it, it's, uh, and I, I haven't studied it closely recently, but even then it was on a quota basis. So there was a, a daily a limit to how much money could move that way. And there was a, a total limit. And I, I'm assuming, I guess, that they've uh, increased both of those. But um, uh, certainly the, the easiest way for investors uh, in the U.S. Uh, to invest in the A share market has historically been uh, that uh, Connect program. But as I also tell people, the, the, the there's nothing good to buy in the A share market. I mean, it's just the same state-owned enterprises, and uh, that have uh, sort of ruined the uh, the broad uh, China uh, products and and uh, held them back. But but Ant Group, uh, other than Kwai Sha Mutai, which is a liquor company, um, I I don't think there's anything I would feel like buying until the Ant Group. But uh, I think I can get it cheaper in Hong Kong. Uh, I suspect. Okay. Um, this gentleman's asking if you know you can buy EMQQ on the Merrill platform. Ha. Ah, um, no, unfortunately, uh, Merrill Lynch uh, advisors do not have access to uh, the uh, uh, top performing emerging markets offering, which seems to be a, a fiduciary question for them, but uh, of all the wirehouses, uh, they are the uh, only one that uh, does not uh, give their investors uh, and advisors access to it. So, so Kevin, the same gentleman is asking a question regarding Baidu. Uh, he wants to know why Baidu isn't doing as well as, as Baba and, and Tencent. Well, Baidu didn't uh, uh, keep up with the times. I mean, they had a stranglehold on search, and you know, obviously that before Alibaba came along, that's the name that uh, uh, people uh, knew. And uh, and search, uh, uh, especially when search went mobile, which is how everybody does everything now, um, they didn't keep up, and uh, so. Uh, competitors uh, took a lot of that market, um, and they also didn't uh, invest uh, as much in uh, going in new directions. Now they do uh, apparently have uh, a pretty uh, deep uh, um, expertise in uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, AI, but uh, I think the bottom. I think the simply stated, they they didn't manage. They weren't managed very well, and perhaps. Uh, the early uh, leadership was uh, distracted by the uh, trappings of wealth and didn't uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, stay as hungry as some of the other uh, leaders like uh, Alibaba and Tencent. So here's a couple of uh, easy questions. How many stocks does EMQQ own? And can you disclose the e AUM of EMQQ? Uh, the index has 83 stocks in it, and uh, that will continue to go up. There's uh, been a pretty robust IPO uh, calendar this year. So when we do our rebalance uh, at the end of uh, or in, in December, uh, I suspect we'll, we'll grow by at least five or 10 stocks. And um, 
Um, in terms of assets tied to the index there, the US uh, listed uh, offering has about 1.1 billion. And then uh, the USITS uh, offering, which is separate, has uh, about 100 million. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on here. Um, All right. So how do you account for the regulatory risk for Chinese Internet companies? Uh, things like game approval for Tencent and limits on deposit uh, taking for Alipay. Does this risk make investments in Chinese Internet comp companies unanalyzable? Well, um, let me say um, uh, the following. Um, uh, China uh, uh, is a regulated place, just like uh, we are in, in certain areas in, in financial services, in uh, technology, and, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that there is much of anything that we can do to uh, uh, disrupt uh, uh, these businesses. Um, the Chinese government uh, clearly uh, can and has. And in the, in the specific case of gaming, I remember exactly where I was when this uh, showed up. And basically what, what I think is being referenced is, I think it was three years ago, and I think it was December, but Tencent uh, had a, a game uh, that was blocked by the Chinese government. And, uh, they, and they basically stopped approving uh, the release of new games. And my first thought was, oh, well, they must have found that uh, there was uh, some element of the game that was uh, somehow um, slighting the premier or the party and that the game was, uh, the new uh, approvals were blocked for that reason. But uh, it turned out that they blocked them because all the teenagers were getting fat and playing video games. <laughs> And so I was sort of conflicted and basically they were trying to make sure that the, that, you know, the societal elements of, of these things were not uh, uh, something that should be worried about. And I remember feeling, well, I, you know, I have teenagers and uh, I don't, my kids weren't big uh, in Fortnite, but I'd hear stories and read uh, articles about uh, kids uh, staying up till five in the morning uh, under their covers. So. I was a mixed opinion of, about that particular regulation, but you know, they've, they've since moved on and, and you know, that's not so much of an issue, but, but look, China uh, has a government and their government oversees uh, lots of elements of, uh, of life and of uh, you know, things related to the EMQQ story. And so those, those things will remain a risk, but I, don't, I think that the Chinese government is, I think, in, in many ways, the most capitalist government in the world at this point. I mean, they know that they need to go away from state ownership. They know that they need uh, private enterprise and um, entrepreneurship. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not worried that, that their government is going to uh, do anything that's going to um, hold back this story. I mean, they're obviously going to be involved. Uh, in it and uh, want to uh, have some say and oversight of it, but I'm not I'm not terribly worried about uh, about that risk. So next uh, question is from a gentleman by the name of Stephen. He's asking, given the U.S. election and which administration takes control, um, access the economic. I think assess the economic effect on emerging markets growth and also include as it could also be affected by potential geopolitical conflicts, including militarization? Um, well, I, I don't know that I totally understood the question. I think that in terms of our election outcome, um, I, I think either way, uh, the U.S. Uh, is decidedly in an anti-China uh, um, mood, and uh, and I, I guess um, if uh, the Democrats win and P 
Peter Navarro will be out of the picture, which I think would be good for everybody on the planet in some ways. Um, and uh, so, um, so anyhow, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, but I do think it, in general. I mean, with you know, there, there, there is a, <clears throat> you know, there, there is a great deal of tension, <clears throat> at least in the headlines, as relates to uh, our relationship with China, and that's uh, unfortunate. And I'd love uh, to think that we could find a way to get along with them, uh, as uh, my. Uh, one of uh, the, my early China experts, I leaned on a guy named Zach Carabell uh, wrote a book called Superfusion about how uh, the China and the United States have basically become one economy and are intertwined in lots of ways. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, we can't uh, have a more constructive uh, relationship with them. And uh, I, I and I really do feel that. Um, uh, they desire that, and um, and, and that we have some unex, um, some uh, expectations of what they need to do for us to to play with them. And uh, I think it's unfortunate, and I don't uh, I don't see a solution being easy, no matter who wins the election. Okay, um, here is a, a question from a. Um, RIA, do you think the COVID numbers, uh, cases and deaths in China and Russia are honest? Oh, I think they're as honest as they can be. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, you know, there's everybody knows all these things by now, but you know, whether people died that are already sick and so they, you know, they had diabetes, they died from diabetes, but they would have died because of the COVID. I, I, you know, I think the numbers like GDP numbers are, you know, they're kind of a sloppy uh, thing. Do I think China had millions of people die and they swept it under the rug? No, I don't, I don't know what, what they have to benefit from doing that. I think that they were disciplined and when they had a lockdown, they enforced it. And uh, they used drones to make sure you weren't outside. And if you were, uh, they would uh, swoop down and uh, let you know that you were on film and you needed to get back inside. So I don't believe that uh, China intentionally would, you know, limit the reporting. And uh, now Russia is a different story. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that I can speak to, to that. Um, but uh, uh, I don't... Uh, I don't think China's uh, had, it's possible they had, you know, 50% uh, more, but, but even that is, you know, like less than, uh, well, our numbers are significantly bigger than uh, everybody else's at this point. Um, so, and, I, and actually, if, just to be frank with you, I mean, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the, uh, all the anti-China uh, people haven't focused more on this. And, and uh, I know early on that somebody used some language saying that uh, essentially that China had seeded the, the global pandemic by putting people on planes uh, uh, to spread the disease. I, I think uh, that, that's preposterous, but I'm surprised why we haven't seen more uh, finger pointing and anger uh, especially when uh, our uh, population and economy are getting ravaged. And meanwhile, China's uh, back on track and uh, uh, didn't have to spend the trillions of dollars. And as the son, uh, as, a, as a father of a 20-year-old of a, a uh, uh, college student whose sophomore year was uh, interrupted by uh, this, uh, I know there was a lot of anger and I know that... Uh, when he, my son realized that uh, he couldn't uh, keep uh, doing the things that a sophomore in college could do, he thought uh, Xi Jinping should pay for this. So uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised that that uh, rhetoric towards China isn't stronger, but I, and I do believe that they had the, the approximately the number of cases they reported. I hope that answered the question. Yes, that was that was a good answer. Um, there's another gentleman that's asking about uh, more operational questions. Um, can you talk about the investment team's depth or process to function in Kevin's absence? 
please address concerns um, of owning EMQQ as a core EM position over a long-term horizon? Um, so in terms of uh, our, uh, the, the first question, like, okay, well, what if, you, if Kevin's not there? This really shouldn't be an issue. I mean, this, again, this is a rules-based index. Um, we have a committee that oversees it. And uh, um, so I don't uh, think there's any uh, issues there. I mean, it's not like I'm uh, uh, picking the individual stocks. Again, we, we do have a, an index committee and, a, and a, it's a rules-based approach. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not doing the trading or any of those things. So I don't, I'm not worried about uh, continuity in my absence. And uh, in terms of the, I think the second part of the question about uh, uh, long-term core uh, of an EM allocation, you know, I, as I said earlier, I, I'm, uh, and this is, you know, I've always tried to think sort of originally and out of the box, I guess not intentionally, but I'm, I'm becoming very much radicalized, uh, particularly this year and, and watching uh, the retail investor uh, uh, flurry. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm finding disturbing, but, but I'm, in, in terms of the, the construct of traditional asset allocation and modern portfolio theory and the efficient frontier, I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm not sure I'm buying that anymore as uh, the optimal way to, to approach uh, one's investment uh, portfolio. So, um, uh, and as part of that, again, as I think about my colleagues and our 401k plan and, and, and uh, you know, the target date, life uh, cycle allocations, and I've got uh, two colleagues who are going to be uh, contributing to their retirement accounts for 30 plus years. You know, again, I'm biased in the, it's a free country and they're free to do what they choose, but I have, uh, we're in the process of, of, uh, transitioning our 401k plan to ensure that uh, these uh, young investors can um, uh, buy things other than the traditional uh, funds. And uh, certainly I will encourage them to uh, look at buying um, uh, uh, things like uh, like I've talked about here and uh, including some of the individual companies. So I, I'm, I'm radicalized and, uh, and biased, so I, I may not be the best person to ask. Although I guess I could reference uh, my uh, colleague, Bert Malkiel, uh, who uh, has been uh, quoted both uh, uh, two different places, including Barron's this year, but he, his approach uh, for his grandchildren includes uh, a position in uh, uh, the emerging markets internet space. So. Oh, so if Kevin, you have a lot more questions. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking though that we should make this possibly the final, the final one, and then the questions that we couldn't get to, you can follow up with those people directly. Um, Whatever you prefer, Michael. But I'm, I'm here. I've got water, and I don't have anything else to do for another hour and a half. So I'm happy to stay on. And, and... <laughs> all right, all right. Um, this next question is, what are your thoughts on the Ant IPO and fintech opportunity in other countries? Well, I think that um, uh, I, I, you know, as I said in my in my remarks, I think it's a monster, and I think uh, you know we've we've been seeing this fintech thing uh, pretty clearly. And, and, you know, it, it was about 24 months ago, maybe 30 months ago, when we really started emphasizing how big this uh, fintech part of the story was. And, and it was because of Mercado Libre. And again, this company had always been the leader in commerce and in payments with their Merc Mercado Pago platform. But we started to see an acceleration in uh, what that meant. And that was driving uh, this stock up. It doubled both last year and this year, largely based on that acceleration. And what's 
you know, it's now sort of crystal clear to me now, but what wasn't as much is that once you have the payments on, on the app, then, then the, the financial world is yours to take and layering in other offerings, uh, providing, uh, in the case of Alibaba, corporate banking services to the thousands of uh, vendors that sell on the platform. And so uh, uh, it's a big deal. And again, it's, it's, we're way behind. I mean, I had someone hand me two metal discs yesterday uh, when I purchased something you know, that cost six dollars and fifty cents, and I, I and they didn't take uh, uh, Apple Pay, so I had to hand them uh, three pieces of paper, and they handed me two uh, metal discs back. And so, the reality is that most of the world is just leapfrogging that. The numbers in India are staggering in terms of where they're projected to be uh, digitally, and uh, it will be. Uh, very quickly, they will have more uh, mobile uh, payments than cash payments in their country. And then a lot of it has to do with how, you know, it, it, when I go into 7-Eleven, let's say, and let's say I'm wearing a, a sport coat, I'm going to have my wallet in one chest pocket and I'm going to have my smartphone in the other. And uh, on the counter is a chip reader. And to go in my, get my wallet out and put the, the, the card in the chip reader, that might take me eight seconds, right? Now, it might take me only six seconds to pull out my smartphone and double click and uh, look at the screen. Might take an extra second because I've got a mask on and I've got to type in my code. So it's not that big of an advantage, but the, but, but the reason that this FinTech is such a big deal in emerging markets is nobody has a bank card. And so there, there, again, it's this leapfrogging that's going on, and um, and uh, it's it's a big advantage uh, in a lot of ways for these places as they uh, continue to develop, and and it's a particularly big advantage uh, in uh, China where they're already developed and where uh, this is somewhat ubiquitous, and 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 the wealth creation uh, around this fintech story is very real. And I, I frankly, as you know, again, as a fintech entrepreneur, I, I didn't quite appreciate how big this could be. Um, and uh, in many ways, fintech was, you know, other than the investment related uh, fintech that I was involved with developing, it was sort of an abstract idea to me. But uh, it's, it's not abstract uh, in China or in India, it's real and happening and happening fast and I think has uh, a long way to go. And again, I think it's that uh, it's that payments uh, part of the story. I know that uh, this company, Stone, uh, the, this Brazilian fintech company is basically a payments company right now. This is actually a company that I own uh, in a partnership that I uh, uh, manage for myself and a, a few other people. But um, this company, uh, I think, is you know one of my favorite ways to for the long term to get exposure to uh, this fintech story and and uh, and the, you, know, you listen to this the founder of this company who's a sort of thirty something year old wonder kid uh, a Harvard grad from uh, from Brazil he knows that he knows what his plan is and uh, it's not the payments that's just the gateway and then once you got the money. Uh, there's lots of disruption to be had. So speaking of uh, Brazil, um, we have a question from, from Yuri. Um, and I don't know if you know this company or not, but uh, what what's uh, your thoughts about Vedanta and their restructure? And how about Kaisha? 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 Are those, um, are those th like two, two things that you know about or? Uh, I, I, I have to confess, I don't know that I'm familiar with either of those uh, companies, but if, if uh, Michael, if, if you can somehow provide me the names or if the person asking the question uh, can send them to me. I, I, if I don't know them, I, I probably, if I don't know them by name, I probably know them by, by reference. Absolutely. So. Yuri, just send me send me a note, um, and I will uh, pass it along to to Kevin. Um, 
So, gentleman Ramon, he wants to know if you have any peers that are in your space. Um. Well, I I had a couple of flippant, cocky things to say, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, we have sort of related uh, things out there. There's a, a China internet uh, a product that's actually bigger than us. Uh, it's limited to just uh, the Chinese names, and uh, uh, and actually, you know, we've we've um, our uh, uh, group has performed significantly better than it has. Early this year, I was concerned that uh, they would, in fact, uh, do better than us this year because I recognized that China was likely to uh, uh, contain this uh, better than anybody, and that that would translate into. Uh, that particular approach uh, doing better, but uh, I don't think uh, that's happened. I think we have uh, continued to uh, produce better than they have. Um, there's uh, a China uh, technology uh, ETF uh, with the Invesco name on it and the ticker CQQQ, which I created uh, 10 or uh, 11 years ago. And frankly, I would have made that just internet companies, but there wasn't enough of them. Um, so we had to include the hard technology companies like uh, Huawei, or not Huawei, but uh, like uh, Hanhai and Lenovo. And so that, uh, that, that's, again, got, that's only China and it is not just internet. And, uh, and, and I'd also, in, in the case of that particular offering, um, we, uh, the group I was associated with, no longer provides the index to it, and I think partially because of that, um, they no longer own Alibaba, so I, I don't think that their eyes are on it the way it should be, because somehow in their uh, index methodology, they have uh, lost the biggest um, Chinese technology company. So those are, those are the two that funds that people uh, reference that are the closest to what we do. Okay. Here's another question. What are the biggest risks to companies in EM and specifically to the businesses that you are investing in over the next, uh, decade? Well, um, uh, I mean, that's a pretty broad uh, question. I, I guess, uh, you know, the risks are war, China, U.S. Uh, war, are there uh, uh, economic war or physical war and uh, perhaps a conflict over Taiwan, which uh, continues to show up uh, in the headlines as a, as a risk. Oh, I, it's hard for me to imagine a, a circumstance where a shooting war between any major countries <clears throat> happens. I mean, it's, you know, you try to think about what that would even mean uh, today, but uh, there are uh, people that I, I guess I would call alarmists that uh, are uh, saying that uh, it's only a matter of time till Hong Kong or to rather till uh, China uh, invades to repossess Taiwan and, and there's a, some sort of a, a, a shooting battle. Um, so, uh, I guess that's probably a risk. I, I guess uh, another risk uh, that uh, we're all uh, living with now is a another pandemic or this pandemic uh, not uh, ending the way uh, perhaps we're thinking about it. I think that those are risks to the world. But uh, the real story here, I think, is it's it's a secular thing. I mean, you got all these people in the world and and uh, they want stuff, and uh, and they're getting stuff, and uh, uh, and one and one of the things they want is a smartphone, and uh, and once they get it, it, you know they they're going to continue uh, going through their lives and grow and evolve with it in their pocket, and uh, their lives uh, intertwined with it, just as we've seen here uh, in our lives uh, over the last ten years since uh, we got our. Uh, first smartphones. So the next question is about profitability. Uh, how profitable will the Chinese export of fintech to uh, th to the third world, such as uh, Africa, be? 
Well, I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, let, I mean, let me, let me just make up my answer as I think about it. I mean, I, I, I think that the reality is that that in the case of the uh, these companies, most of them really are uh, domestic plays, and uh, you know, Alipay uh, does have uh, operations elsewhere. Uh, but I think that they won't, they're just not as, as meaningful. Uh, in terms of Africa, M-Pesa is the uh, platform that dominates currently, and that's owned by a, a consortium, including, uh, uh, I think, uh, MTN. Um, but payments are, they are booming. I mean, in Southeast Asia, they're booming. And uh, uh, in India, uh, they're booming and off of a low base. So um, I just, I don't know that, uh, and and I guess the other thing is, yeah, as mentioned, in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of situations, in fact, the majority of them, uh, Alibaba and Tencent aren't going in and competing directly. They're just finding the local uh, companies that are leading and investing in them. And so, as 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 I mentioned in India, the payments leader is forty five percent owned by Alibaba and. Uh, so they're 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 competing that way, I think, more so than competing directly. All right. So this next one's more of a macro question for for EM. Um, in the current environment, where small and mid market companies have been impacted by the pandemic and lack of sales, how do you see the impact of growing delinquencies for banks? Number one. Number two, do you see salary cuts and job losses impacting the consumption patterns in EM versus DM? And then the third one, how do you see this impact affecting the valuations in the short run? Um, okay, well, let me uh, uh, sort my brain out on that. So I think, uh, first of all, uh, in the case of China, which I'll again I'll focus on that first, since that's the, the biggest part of the, uh, the story here, um, they had a lot of the same problems in terms of the small business owners uh, struggling. Now, the, they benefited greatly uh, by, by two things. First of all, they have a high savings rate. So a lot of our people uh, and the small business owners are sort of month to monthers and, uh, you know, a, a frightening large percentage of our population uh, lives uh, that sort of way, whereas China has a, 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 a population that are prodigious savers and historically have saved about, uh, well, I think 40% of their income they've saved. So most of those uh, restaurants and uh, other uh, you know, small business owners that were hit very hard uh, weren't uh, BK'd in, you know, six weeks. Um, secondly, uh, they exited the lockdown uh, in a pretty, uh, uh, you know, relatively short time frame. So the damage uh, to, to their uh, equivalents uh, just wasn't as bad because they were better prepared and uh, it didn't last as long. Uh, here, uh, we have this uh, idea of this K-shaped recovery, and, uh, and I think that that, I guess, as I think about uh, how, uh, which, which, again, I, I'm sure that most, if not all, are familiar with this idea, but the K-shaped recovery being that the part of the population is going up, up and doing fine, and then part of the population is doing uh, the other way, and I think that on balance uh, in emerging markets, there there are less people that are part of that upward K. Uh, the wealth is a bit more concentrated. And so the, the vast majority of them are on the, uh, the lower part of the K. But, but they're also, you know, these are, you know, by definition, these are uh, low income places to start with and subsistence uh, living in, uh, in lots of parts of the population. So uh, I don't know that uh, they, these things will be uh, as severe on a relative basis um, uh, in the, the developing world. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't know that I can say much more than that about the question. 
Okay. Um, next gentleman has a question about what percentage of the stocks held are ADRs, uh, American Depository Receipts. Um, about half of the companies I trade here, and um, and you know to get technical, I don't. People, I think, frequently anything that trades here, the people think it's an ADR, and I, I, that I don't think is totally true because it, there's a lot of companies that they only trade here. So that it's, you know, traditional ADR, you've you've taken some shares of Petrobras and you put them on deposit and made a receipt of them here, but uh, things like uh, Baidu don't have a listing anywhere else. So um, I think that is technically considered an ADS, but either way those types of companies, ADRs and, and similar uh, U.S. listings are about half of, uh, of the index. And, and in spite of the threat to delist uh, by the Senate bill, uh, these companies are still coming here, um, but they're also, some of them are also uh, listing in Hong Kong. And, um, and whether that's uh, out of reaction that they might be delisted here or uh, to gain access to the mainland investors that can use that same Hong Kong Shanghai Connect program. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of uh, reasons. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Hold on one second. Um, So this person is asking about the difference in performance of EMQQ monthly performance uh, for the ETF versus the index. And can you explain the difference? Well, I don't know what particular um, month is being referenced and nor do I have that data in front of me, but they, uh, they should be pretty close. I mean, like within a Few basis points, I would think, but I, I can't speak to any uh, specifics uh, where I'm sitting right now. So perhaps your your team can follow up with this gentleman uh, directly. By um, all means. And I think we have. Hold on one second. I think we have gotten. All right. So this question I didn't touch. This is a gentleman who's asking for some advice for his son who's a college student that you know regarding a career path into emerging markets which country and which sub industries and and why if you were to give advice to somebody what would your advice be which countries which sub industries and what's your reasoning behind it well um, that's a great question, and I will have uh, fun uh, answering that. So uh, one piece of advice I give to every young person and and, for, and also everybody in the investment business is go to China and just go and see it and uh, spend as much time as uh, you can uh, afford to be there and, and can handle being there. Uh, it is a little bit intense uh, on your first visit, but... Uh, I think uh, that uh, both for uh, a younger person and anybody that hasn't been there that's in the investment business and, and for whom uh, decisions need to be made about how money is allocated, uh, I think uh, they will uh, benefit in both as a human and as uh, someone thinking about the world and the markets, uh, I think they will benefit from that. And uh, every any time I meet a young uh, person that's uh, you know working in the investment business, but sort of unencumbered by a, a family or spouse or home, and uh, has some uh, mobility, I urge them uh, to go and do just that and see uh, China. Um, and uh, uh, and so that would be my first advice in terms of career path and opportunities, I think that, um, I, I guess I, I, this is um, sort of advice I gave to Guggenheim when we were partnering with them, which is, don't, 
you know, I, I would say, look, we're not going to go to China and sell anything to anybody, right? Um, that's, that's, and we could, and but it's going to take a long time and be complicated, but we're better off uh, selling China to Americans. And because we know uh, America and our investment markets. So I would kind of give the same advice uh, to, to a college student, which is, you know, you can become a, a, an expert in emerging markets broadly or in any of the individual countries or regions. But um, I think uh, your easiest path is going to be to find a way to bridge between uh, your uh, advantage as being an American and whatever it is that uh, is happening in emerging markets that intrigues you and whether that's uh, working in the investment business or the travel business or uh, anything, uh, I think uh, sort of being a bridge uh, from uh, emerging markets to your own uh, developed market is uh, probably the easiest thing to do. So, all right, Kev, we are out of uh, time today. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for staying on and uh, answering all these questions. Um, as you can tell, people are very passionate about your presentation today. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be following up with everybody uh, and sending out contact information on who you can get in touch with uh, from EMQQ. I'll send you materials. A lot of people ask for copies of the presentation and a recording. Yes, that will be provided. Um, I need like a, a, a couple of days to process everything, uh, but I do promise you I will send it out uh, to you and it will have, uh, you know, ways to contact, uh, you know, Kevin, his team. Um, and if you have any questions, always, you know, don't hesitate to, um, to, to ask me and I'll, I'll get you the information that you're looking for. Um, but again, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, you know, it was, it was very uh, enlightening, very detailed. And um, as you can tell, uh, people are very passionate about it. So with that, um, I just wanted to conclude our conversation for the day. Great, Michael. Thank you very much. And thank you all uh, for uh, attending. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Have a, have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now.